It's time for the Bible Geek. I am that geek. Robert M. Price, Robert M. Price, postmodern, deconstruct, super-powered demigod. It's Robert M. Price, broadcasting to you from the depths of the vaults of Yo Vambus. You Clark Ashton Smith fans will get the reference. I actually am in one of my uh, rooms filled with science fiction, horror, uh, fantasy books, uh, comic books, uh, and an endless number of action figures. And on the door I have uh, this plaque that I got from Lynn Carter decades ago with... Uh, that he used to have on the door of his apartment, the vaults of Yovambus. So that's where I've moved my equipment to, and uh, that's the the new home of the Bible Geek Studio, as it were. Well, what uh, what the heck, let's get on to some uh, yummy questions. So this should be fun. I uh, want to let you know I still have copies, uh, however, reversed. Uh, I want to tell you I got copies of uh, the historical Bejesus, Bart Ehrman, and the Quest of the Historical Jesus of Nazareth, uh, available for uh, 15 bucks a piece, and uh, for 20 that uh, collection of W.C. von Manen's essays, A Wave of Hypercriticism, with a couple of essays by me tossed in. And uh, I should also tell you uh, the uh, book, The Rejoinder to O'Reilly's Killing Jesus, my uh, book, Killing History, Jesus in the No Spin Zone, is due out any minute now. I'm to get my uh, copies from the publisher any day, they tell me. And uh, let's see, I got an idea for a new one. Uh, and uh, based on a uh, discussion I just had with Bo Bennett uh, on the Humanist Hour, which is going to, uh, I think, come out uh, on Wednesday, uh, and uh, it was ten things you want to know about the Bible. I'm thinking of calling. I'm thinking, as I say, making it into a book, and uh, calling it after a Jim Jones quote: "This paper idol." We'll see. But uh, at any rate, how about those questions? Here's one from the esteemed Jorby. If you've ever doubted there was a God or a Jesus, give a listen to Christians debating details of their own religion. I've done a lot of listening and a little talking. I've done a lot of reading and a little writing. And little writing, sorry. I'm still trying to figure out if I should just admit I'm wholly, wholly unconvinced of both Jesus and God and be disinherited from my wealthy brother's considerable wealth for being an agnostic heretic. I make a decent salary. Hmm... Uh, greetings, Dr. Price and my fellow geeks. Uh, Jorby here with more Bible difficulties. When it comes to building classic cars, I like swapping parts around between manufacturers. I'm no purist. It's a hobby. Part of my day job requires me to be an auditor of a corporation's financial records. If my boss wants me to find something, I will. I've benefited greatly in my biblical studies by combining my love and artistry in the classic car world... With the day job, I like to think I can now spot parallels, errors, and flat-out omissions when I read the Bible. Once again, that Old Testament has got me in its spell. You know, that book of, you know, that the book of Exodus was woven well. Do our modern eyes and ears miss something, though? At the foot of Sinai, while Moses is on the mount carving commandments with Jethro, I mean, talking with God so God can give him the commandments. Uh, Strange things were afoot at the Circle K with Aaron and the Hebrews. And here's Exodus 32, 1 through 7 from the New King James Version. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Aaron answered them, And take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast of the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, Atheist, uh, Atheist, gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt? 
When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, ah, Tomorrow there'll be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. I assume that means risk games if we're reading the New King James. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, uh, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. What I zeroed in on is that Aaron says, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. Shouldn't Aaron and Israel know what God looks like according to the scriptures? Let's go back a few chapters in time. Exodus 19.24 The Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you, but the priests and the people must not force their way to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. The Bible says that no man has seen God. John 1.18 no man, oh wait, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he's declared him. Or First John 4, 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us, pilgrim. I know it's true because the Bible says it's true. Hallelujah. Even if this is also true... Exodus 24, 1 through 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance. But Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. It sure seems that Aaron and a few priests saw God when they did worship at a distance. I have to be honest, Dr. Price, it seems like this is Jethro's kind of wisdom. You'll remember that Jethro encouraged Moses not to overextend himself and appoint judges and come up with laws and statutes for the people. For the people, uh, could Jethro have been hiding on Sinai while Moses was getting all this down with his iPad? Now, some of you may be skeptical about iPads in the Bible. No, it is not an anachronism. It is a prophetic ref... Oh, I'm sorry, Jarvi had that. Sorry. Um, could they have just conspired together to form and institute all of these rules for is Israel? Uh, and I nearly forgot to ask, since Aaron did see God and he told Israel the calf was their gods who brought them out of Egypt... Isn't it more likely that the golden god was not Yahweh nor Jim Morrison uh, of the doors, but Hathor and Apis? Um, geez, what the heck was... Uh, Davis G, I've got some funny thing on the screen i got to get rid of. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the bull, the divine bull, right? Um, and Hathor was a uh, cow. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, that may explain the sacrificing of bulls and cows. What are the geeks' thoughts on these exciting tales from the Bible? I, I do find them very fascinating. And uh, there is this uh, back-and-forth sort of theological ping-pong between one whether one can see God and live, uh, because certain passages pretty clearly say you can't. Right, uh, when Mo asks uh, God, uh, look, uh, I know you've done a lot, but uh, show me, uh, do me a favor here. Um, let me see your face. He says, uh, I'm sorry, a man cannot see my face and live. Uh, but if you uh, hide over there in the cleft of the rock, I'll walk by and you can see my backside. Uh, that, that's mind-blowing enough. And he does. Well, um... So he can't see God's face, not even Moses, right? In the burning bush episode, many about 30 chapters before that, right? Uh, he apparently could see God, at least in the form of the burning bush, but was afraid to. Uh, what's the deal there? Uh, then uh, there's various stories where Hagar and uh, 
uh, Samson's mother, Mrs. Manoah, actually see the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, and survive it and are surprised. Have we really seen God and lived and so on? Moses is later said to see God face to face. There's never been another prophet like Mo who spoke to God as a man speaks with his friend face to face. Well, which is it? Well, you see, this is not a unified or unitary narrative. I mean, by using both those words, what I mean is uh, it's not a single narrative from one author, and it, and, uh, it is also not successfully harmonized. So you have very, very helpful bits and pieces and loose ends. And uh, what about this? What's the verdict? Can one see God and live or not? Actually, I sort of think Todorov deals with this in... Uh, a book he did on uh, structuralism, that it almost doesn't matter that all of them share this theme of uh, the danger of seeing God. Some of them say you can't do it, while others imply that's what people thought and were surprised when they did manage to see him and live. Uh, so it's like a, the common theme and the different stories bounce off it in different ways. Uh, and uh, it's easy to imagine how such a, uh, such a ricocheting theology could come about. Uh, is, is it's, it's like the you cannot see God and live is the, uh, the hurdle put up for some character to show their extraordinary character or God's extraordinary protection of them when they do manage to do the impossible. So I think that's what's going on. That's a kind of a reconciliation. I mean, it accounts for the diversity, the, the, the changes rung on the theme without trying to harmonize them, which can't be done, and if you did, would just flatten out the narrative, unfortunately. As to whether there was a kind of a priestcraft uh, stunt, a prank uh, affected by Jethro here, that's kind of like what the priests of uh, Baal do in the Bell and the Dragon section of Daniel. Uh, also what the Holy Therns do on Barsoom in the great John Carter novels by Edgar Rice Burroughs. But uh, to me, to even suggest that is uh, like a return to 18th century Protestant rationalism, where you're trying to say, okay, let's keep all the characters in, in their places on the stage, but just re-explain what we see happening. There's no reason to take it that seriously as history. Uh, rather, you're just dealing with uh, ragtag bits of inconsistent myth, uh, all of which are terrific. I mean, the, the, the question you ask, which is a very good one, uh, wait a minute, uh, didn't, uh, didn't Aaron know what uh, Yahweh looked like? And the, the description implies that he had humanoid form. What, why does he say uh, that uh, God looks like a bull or a cat? Well, of course, the, uh, the stories come from different sources and the uh, the one where uh, the uh, golden calf is made is part of a uh, a redaction of an earlier story that was in ceremonial myth trying to explain why the northern shrines or temples at ban and death sorry, <laughs> dan and bethel depicted God in the form of a young bull. And uh, naturally, people would say, ah, geez, how, how do we know God looks like this? And they would tell the original version of what is now a pathetic and ridiculous excuse by Aaron, uh, surmounted by the phrase, yeah, that's the ticket, uh, where uh, Aaron didn't originally say, well, I, uh, he didn't say uh, that... Uh, it didn't. The story didn't say that he decided to craft this calf. Rather, the I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up today. The, what is now presented as a ridiculous excuse when Moses said, "What are you doing?" Uh, he says, "Well, look, uh, it wasn't really my fault. I they said make us a likeness of God. And of course, I don't know what God looks like, so I said, give me all your gold. We'll throw it in there and leave it to God to miraculously make it come out in the image He has chosen and 
this calf appeared. Of course, that was originally the point. He hadn't seen God, and so he left it to God to decide what image to use. That's what they told people. Now, that, of course, is a kind of priestcraft, a pious fraud to make up that story. But uh, to actually picture this happening... That's that's a different matter. I uh, with uh, with Jethro, uh, you know, they'll never catch on to this snicker snicker. Yeah, that that uh, considers it too historical, I think. But you are so right, Jorby, with the looking for parallels and contradictions and so on. Vitally important, maybe the most important weapon in the arsenal of the critic. Okay, Michelle from Canada. In the pre-Nicene New Testament, in other works and on your show, you talk about how Luke and other gospel writers got it wrong for for simple sayings and, quote, facts, unquote, such as the shepherds and the night watch and the nativity in Luke and the mustard seed being the smallest. I was wondering where we could get correct information concerning these things, for instance, ancient texts and archaeology, since I've been wondering how we know these gospel traditions are just plain wrong. It's interesting to note that the Harper Collins Study Bible and other study Bibles don't draw any attention to this, and weekly sermons in the Catholic tradition at the service I sometimes go to keep promoting the inaccurate knowledge. Well, uh, with the Gospels, uh, the place to go, an inexhaustible resource would be David Friedrich Strauss's The Life of Jesus Critically Examined, which, uh, for instance, goes into all this stuff with the inconsistencies, the inaccuracies, the anachronisms and all that with the nativity stories and the whole darn gospel. That book is hundreds of pages of tiny type, but I, for one, have always found it easy going. I think the prose is lucid. It was translated into English by Mary Ann Evans, who used the pen name to George... Uh, well, my God, what was it? I can't believe I'm blanking out on that. George Eliot. Uh, and uh, so I think it's beautifully uh, done. He doesn't deal with the saying so much, but as for this thing with the seed... It's just clear from botany, just look it up, um, that uh, the mustard seed is not the smallest. The orchid seed is smaller, and there's another one at least uh, smaller than that. So uh, that's not debated. And in fact, uh, fundamentalists try to slide out of that one by saying, well, uh, like in the New International Version, in one of those passages, it slips the possessive pronoun your in there where it actually says the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds they say the smallest of all your seeds so as to create the impression that Jesus says now how am I going to put this you you stupid primitives uh, don't know about smaller seeds so I'll say well the the smallest of the seeds you know in this backwoods backwater and so on uh, that's totally gratuitous I mean sometimes it's true that uh, possessive seems to be implied so they don't bother adding it but this is not one of those places and uh Oh, uh, but uh, these historical problems you'll find no better account of them than Strauss, though I have uh, uh, depended on him a discussion of these things in my book The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, which I think you'd probably get a kick out of. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Okay, uh, who's next? Brent from Baltimore, Maryland. What's the deal with all the talk of circumcision in the Bible? God's original covenant with man starts with circumcision. I can also think of Moses' wife's hasty circumcision of their son to save Moses from God. <laughs> David's sack of Philistine foreskins to appease Saul. And Joshua's army getting circumcised before attacking Jericho. Are there other strange instances of circumcision in the Bible? What's with the fixation on foreskins? Well, there's another one where uh, this uh, the Prince of Shechem, whatever his name is, is on a date with uh, with uh, oh boy, I'm not with it today. Uh, not Diana, um, Dinah, uh, the one daughter of Jacob, uh, and uh, it's getting hot and heavy, and he rapes her, uh, but he loves her. Uh, actually, he just 
didn't control himself. I don't want to say couldn't control himself in such a situation, but he didn't control himself. And he still approaches Jacob and says, uh, look, I, I'm sorry about this, but I'm willing to make uh, good on it. I'd like to marry her. And uh, and the, the couple of his brothers are not too thrilled. I think it's Levi and Simeon. And they say, uh, well, we'll go along with that if all of you, if your males get circumcised, because they weren't part of the Abrahamic covenant yet. And so the prince says, well, okay. And everybody is circumcised. And, of course, they were adults when they were circumcised, most of them, and it kind of hurts. Uh, and so they're all sitting around, uh, cooling their heels, uh, waiting for the pain to subside. And then you find out this was a nasty trick on the part of Simeon and Levi, who sneak into the city, going house to house, killing all the men of Shechem, uh, while they're not in a much of a mood to uh, get up and fight. Uh, so there's another weird one with circumcision, but I think you've hit the biggie there with uh, Moses and Gershom and Zipporah. Oh boy, that's uh, these things tend to have a ceremonial significance. Usually, uh, the the uh, thing with Moses marking and legitimating it. Anybody tell me the difference between the word legitimating and the word legitimizing? Anyway, uh, it's trying to reinforce a transition from bridegroom circumcision to infant circumcision by making it look like Moses uh, should have gotten circumcised when he became, either went through the rite of passage to marriageable adulthood or even closer to his marriage, but he hadn't. And so God was upset with him. And, uh, and then his wife... Uh, saves the day by circumcising their infant son on the spot and touching his foreskin to the edge end of Moses penis as if it counts for him and uh, this is telling an earlier like a story about an earlier state affair of affairs in the terms of a later one because um, the uh, like the, the Moses wasn't circumcised sort of presupposes that that there was already a good reason for him not to have followed the bridegroom circumcision practice. Uh, and then he's let off the hook when they switch to infant circumcision. But of course, it's hard to imagine Moses would not have been circumcised already had that been the tradition. So uh, it's a bit confused, but that hardly matters as long as the punchline is what they, they want. Uh, but circumcision is important. It was not a uniquely Israelite custom, nor does it claim it was, I hasten to add. But uh, this is supposed to be the, uh, the sign of the covenant that the, uh, all those descended from Abe and even their servants and so on have to be circumcised. Um, and, and presumably it's like a token sacrifice of flesh because it also seems to represent a replacement of the sacrifice of the firstborn male that was also mitigated in other traditions surviving in the Bible by offering the firstborn of an animal instead to redeem the life of the firstborn son from any mother because you owe it to, to God and well alright you do but he'll accept an animal substitute or in this case he'll accept a token sacrifice of flesh instead of the firstborn's life, just the the uh, the, the foreskin, and and then might as well apply to everybody. I remember in uh, Raleigh, uh, back in the mid '80s, uh, we we're driving around, Carol and I and some friends, and happened to see on some fast food joint it said uh, on the marquee fur skins are here I forget what the heck that was some sort of stuffed potato thing I'd seen it on TV but I said fur skins are here I always wondered what they did with them but uh, anyway yeah the big item in 
in Judaism even today. And that's why we got a big problem looming. Now I think people can see the general European anti-Semitic context for this. But a few years ago, you had uh, like a German court ruling that you couldn't circumcise infants because they should have some choice in the matter. Uh, despite the fact that this is the central ritual of Judaism and you have to do it, uh, eh, who cares, right? That's uh, unbelievable. Uh, I mean, insensitivity is putting it mildly, but now we can see it's part of this general Jew hatred in supposedly civilized Europe, a disgusting spectacle. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, from Dr. Barton. I used to do his questions in a German accent. Why not? The author of Luke seems very insistent that Luke, I'm sorry, oh my God, that Jesus is the new Elijah. I have a follow up question to that. Does the author of Luke envision a new Elisha as well? Elijah with a J, Elisha with an S H. After all, the story of Elijah isn't nearly as interesting without Elisha taking up Elijah's mantle and a double dose of Yahweh's ruach, or spirit. If Luke has a transfer of the mantle, then it doesn't come to mind, nor does the identity of a new Elisha. It does occur to me that the double dose of spirit could have been split between Peter and Paul, or he could have dropped the whole thing entirely. So is this matter of soul judging importance, I turn to you, O oh great Nihil uh, uh, Bible geek. Uh, well, I think the, that's a very good question. I think what Luke has done with that is to... Uh, I know this gets a little more complicated if you bring in the question of how much is original writing by the one we call Luke and how much is a redacted source. But just to oversimplify uh, on that, I'd say the Pentecost story is Luke's version of the bestowal of the double portion of Elijah's miracle working spirit on his successor Elisha the 120 collectively are the new Elisha and then by extension everybody you your children and those afar off who can receive the the baptism of the spirit the same way are kind of a collective Elisha because he does seem to set it up that way and uh, there's also in Luke this uh, kind of um, Marcionite contrast of Jesus with Elijah, which oddly presupposes the parallel. Like when uh, the Samaritans refused to let Jesus and the others into the Holiday Inn, and uh, James and John says, son of a bitch, uh, Lord, don't you want us to call down fire to barbecue these bastards just like Elijah did with those uh, pain in the rear Samaritans in his day? And Jesus says, you don't know what you're talking about, uh, the or you do not know what spirit you were of, interestingly. Um, the Son of Man came to save men's lives, not to destroy them. And they went on from there. It's like, uh, well, I uh, could have done what Elijah did, but he didn't. He was better than that. And Or Elijah let Elisha get away with, uh, he called him to follow, and he said, just let me say goodbye to my parents. Said, Look, I, I'm not the boss of you. Go ahead if you want. And he does, and then he follows him. Jesus is not so lenient. Remember, this guy says, um, uh, I will follow you. Let me go back and uh, what? Uh, I guess he says bury my father, which I assume means uh, either he's just died and he's got to bury him or let me wait till he's dead and take care of it. Who knows? Uh, but Jesus won't let him. He says uh, nobody that uh, puts his hand to the plowshare and then looks back is worthy of the kingdom of God. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you look back, it's like a runner in a race. Don't look around to see if anybody's gaining on you. That slows you down. Uh, and in the same way, if you look to the side, either to the right or to the left while you're plowing, you're not going to plow a straight furrow. Uh, and so he says, look, don't. No, enough with distractions from the kingdom of God. So uh, Jesus is like Elijah, but better. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I think in the same way that uh, whereas the spirit of Elijah was given to one man, Elisha, it's given to uh, the 12, 
the rest of the the family of Jesus and the rest of the 120 on the day of Pentecost and the church as a whole by extension. I think God is not so stingy. Uh, Elijah, Jesus is not so stingy. So that'd be my guess. Never thought of that before. Your questions always make me think. Appreciate that, uh, Doc. This from Jim Wright. Dear Dr. Geek Most High. Uh, actually, I, I don't use drugs and oppose it. Uh, sorry, uh, would you please discuss on the Bible, Geek, what you think is the correct chronology of the biblical books? I know the Jewish, Tanakh, Protestant Bible, and even Catholic Bibles all have different orders in which the books are placed. Uh, well, none of them try to be chronological, interestingly, um, partly because we don't really know when they were written. Uh, we don't even know what was written relative to what else, generally. Sort of thought I did once, but now who the heck knows? But um, the Tanakh, the, the Hebrew Bible, is uh, it, it's arranged so that you've got the Torah, the first five books, which of course have a lot of law, which is what Torah means, but other narrative too. And then you got the prophets. Oh, wait a minute. That's, uh, and then, then you got the writings, which is the miscellaneous category of later materials. But where where do the histories fit in there? Well, they're part of the prophets. I believe they are the former prophets, if I'm not mistaken. The former and latter. The latter being the so-called writing prophets, the oracles of, uh, com compilation of oracles of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and the twelve, as they call them, or as Christians call them, the minor prophets. They're considered one book. You know, Hosea, Obadiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Haggai, Habakkuk. Joel, Jonah, Amos, and so on. Um, well, the the histories, what we tend to call the Deuteronomic or the Deuteronomistic, if you want a real tongue twister, uh, Deuteronomic history, Joshua through uh, Second Kings, there with uh, without uh, Ruth, these books are called the former prophets, and with some reason because they are compiled to serve as a series of object lessons to warn Jews not to break the covenant with God by showing what happened every time their ancestors did. Uh, namely, they got kicked in the butt. Well, not all those stories say that, but it's pretty clear from the redactional framework that that's the, the framework they're being forced into and and so that does make sense it's like this is illustrative of the doctrine of the prophets that we find in uh, Isaiah Jeremiah and Deuteronomy also which depicts Moses as the greatest of prophets and so forth uh, so yeah the the prophets are placed, placed together the narratives then the oracles now the uh, the the writings uh, that's uh, everything else, the latest batch. That's uh, the book of Job, which is a poetic drama. I mean, it's all written in, in uh, verse, not rhyming verse, but paralleling verse, which was the way Hebrews did it. And the book of Psalms, which is a compilation of five earlier hymn books used in the Jerusalem temple. And then you got the book of Proverbs, which is what the name says, a collection of seven earlier Wait a minute. Yeah, I think seven smaller collections of Proverbs, three of them fictively attributed to, to Solomon. And then there is Ecclesiastes, a late Hellenistic-influenced, hedonistic and pessimistic uh, group of meditations, not impious, uh, not anti-religious, but very worldly. And then some people's favorite book of the Bible... Uh, you got the Song of Solomon, which appears to be a kind of, to us, cryptic a collection of hymns used in the worship of the uh, the dying and rising gods Isis and, I'm sorry, Ishtar and Tammuz, uh, who survive in the, uh, the uh, book as uh, the Shulamite, which is Ishtar Shalmith. And uh, Tammuz is her lover and brother and so on. And uh, they had to remove the names when they decided to retain it for the canon. They had to um, purify it of the polytheistic associations. Um, 
Ruth is a uh, is is in the writings. It it's a narrative, but it really isn't a history that fits into the Deuteronomic history and wasn't part of it originally. Esther is the same sort of a thing, a ceremonial story trying to uh, explain why Jews celebrate Purim, which was originally an Assyrian game, uh, and. Uh, Daniel is in the writings because it, even though, well, it's half narrative, half apocalyptic oracles. It's a, a late book stemming from 100, about 163 BCE, and the canon of the prophets was closed already, so it couldn't be in there, so they threw it in with a miscellaneous group. Likewise, with Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, which apparently formed one single big book, the Great Chronicles. And because uh, the other, like the Deuteronomic history, was already part of the prophetic canon too, so they couldn't slip that in there, and so they stuck them into the uh, into the writings. The Apocrypha is sort of a second writings group that circulated mainly among Greek-speaking Jews, Jews in the Hellenistic diaspora. And they considered it canonical, and so did the early Christians, but uh, Hebrew-speaking Jews in Palestine did not. Uh, so uh, th this was the, uh, it's kind of half subject matter and, uh, oh, I don't know what else you'd call it, pragmatic factors the Catholic and Protestant Bibles reshuffle the deck and put all the historical or pseudo-historical narratives together right after the Torah, which of course is uh, got, has got a lot of narrative material in it, and uh, then put the uh, uh, puts Daniel among the prophets, makes the prophets different from the historical narratives, and then adds the uh, the uh, wisdom literature and stuff under the uh, writings category. F as for the 14 extra books surviving in Greek or parts of books, as with Daniel and uh, Esther, those Greek portions are, the Catholic Church adds to the uh, text of Daniel and Esther. And the other books, the Maccabees, Judith, Tobit, since they're sort of historical narratives. They get stuck in with the Deuteronomic history, Ruth and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah, and uh, uh, the other wisdom books, Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, and so on, are, are stuck in there with uh, Psalms, Proverbs, and so on. So that's a kind of a difficult, dif different topical arrangement. But none of them really pretend to be chronological. The original higher critics like Wellhausen figured that the prophets were before the law, uh, that uh, Jeremiah, for instance, betrays no awareness of the minutia of the laws of the Pentateuch, except, oddly, for some of the Ten Commandments that are mentioned here and there. And in fact, Jeremiah pointedly denies that God commanded any ritual sacrifice laws at all. Uh, so something funny's going on. It seems like he's protesting against uh, the, what he calls in chapter 8 the lying pen of the scribes that has falsified scripture. Yes, that is in the Bible. Uh, so that's still a good possibility, but then again, parts of the prophets' books, some of them were added later, like the, the second uh, Isaiah during the Babylonian exile, the third Isaiah after the return, uh, Deutero Zechariah from the same period, and it gets really uh, messed up. Some would say that the Old Testament was compiled very late, hardly any time before the New Testament, though of course a lot of much more old stuff went into the compilation. As to the uh, Gospels and the Epistles, traditional scholars of all stripes say the Epistles were written first and only then the Gospels. I'm not really sure if that's so. Uh, it, it, all you can really say for certain is that the Epistles preserve an earlier stage of Christology where there was no historical Jesus. Uh, and uh, those narratives and collections of sayings ascribed to him are a later phenomena, assuming a historicization of the Jesus character in the interests of institutional consolidation. Yeah, we, we had a, a founder that taught us stuff that his students passed down. We're not dependent on, a, on subjective visions like these crazy Gnostics.
and so on. So that's uh, probably more of an answer than you wanted, but I'm notoriously difficult to shut up. Oh, let's see. Um... Uh, let's see. I am not sure I have the name of this. Uh... Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think uh, I can make some sense out of this. I think it's just a an issue of uh, spacing. And okay, I think this is uh, from Mike Goodpaster. And uh, yeah, let's. I know I've heard you discuss the connection between Hey Allah Gehenna and the Valley of Hinnom, but I can't recall your opinion on exactly the point Jesus is making in the Gospels. Is this just a metaphor for an actual literal hell that unbelievers will be cast into? Or is he saying you're going to wind up in the dump if you don't follow me? Uh, I, for a long time, was persuaded by the argument for the latter, uh, that, uh, among others, the Armstrong movement, whatever they call it these days, the Worldwide Church of God, the Radio Church of God, whatever, that they propound. And it sounds quite reasonable, though I don't buy it anymore. And that is that that uh, the Valley of Hinnom, also known as Tophet, uh, had been a, a cursed place because of the uh, the uh, history of infant sacrifices to Moloch there that uh, denounced a few places in the Old Testament. And that as a result, it was deemed so foul, so ceremonially unclean and in an irredeemable way, couldn't be spiritually fumigated, that uh, it was just made into a garbage dump where the the carcasses of unclean animals were thrown, that is, non-kosher animals, and even the carcasses of uh, human uh, criminals and outcasts would be thrown. In other words, they couldn't be given a decent burial, and so they'd just dump the carcasses out, sort of in the way it suggests in Isaiah 14 that the king of Babylon, when overthrown, was it Belshazzar, I guess, that he, when he gets down to uh, Sheol, the resting place of the dead, the other kings are surprised to see him and say, you're, you're not lying in state in your own tomb like our bodies are. You, you, your body was thrown into the street like a sack of beef. What, what happened? Well, that's kind of the idea. You can't be given a, a, a decent burial, so they just dump you. And that Jesus is warning about sins that are so serious in their possibilities that you could be reckoned an apostle a reprobate and not given a decent burial. To hell with you, you're just dumped in the junkyard. That is a tempting view, but it probably is wrong. I think it was first, as far as we know, propounded by uh, David Kimchi, a late medieval rabbinical commentator. An interesting guess, but uh, archaeology shows that there is no evidence of any kind of garbage dump or burial site in, in the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, so that leaves us looking back at the original stories about Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom, or Tophet, uh, and uh, I that really supplies its own rationale for what Jesus and uh, and the Quran, which mentions Jehinnom or Gehenna frequently, what they're talking about. It appears that they they had this sacred cosmos idea of the uh, of the the Temple Mount and other holy mountains, Mount Olympus, and all various ones in in the ancient world. That it was the axis mundi, the spine of the earth, the axle that connects the flat earth with the heavens above. Mercia Eliade discusses this uh, in. Uh, an excellent, excellent treatment in uh, his book, The Sacred and the Profane. Well, uh, so they believed Mount Zion was the, the heavenly axle or axis, and the temple built on the peak of it was an earthly symbol, a kind of a model of, of uh, the firmament over which God lived. Uh, hence, you got Boaz and Jake and the pillars in the temple that's, that represent the cosmic pillars uh, that hold up the earth, mentioned in Job and elsewhere. 
and uh, so on. Uh, the the stars sewn into the veil that hid the Holy of Holies. It's the heavens hiding God above them and so on. Well, at the opposite end, at the bottom, you had the underground inferno kingdom of the god Moloch, um, either Molech or Moloch, depending on which of the interchangeable vowels you preferred. And he was the deity to whom one offered infant sacrifices. Um, so this was a place of horror and a fiery pit of the kingdom of a demon god. However, as far as I know, there isn't any evidence suggesting that that was an, a post-mortem place of punishment. Rather, it was just where infants were consumed by the flames as a burnt offering to Moloch. But it became later a, a place of post-mortem torment under the influence of Neo-Pythagorean preachers who came through the whole Mediterranean world from Sicily, where they, they had picked up the idea of a boiling magma pit of a hell from the geography of Sicily with the fumaroles, the, the lava pits, the volcanoes, and uh, stuff like that. And uh, they believed those were hell mouths, as they call them on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And that made the rounds and entrenched itself into a Jewish belief somewhat later. And that has happened by the time of the New Testament. So those sayings do apparently mean to depict Jesus as warning you away from being damned to the hell of fire. And uh, now where he's talking about Hades, that's sometimes more in question because that could be the equivalent of Sheol. And as we see in the book of Enoch, they, were, they had a very compartmentalized view of the invisible world. The fallen angels were imprisoned here and the, the dead waiting judgment were here and this and that and the other thing. Though Luke has uh, the the rich man and the story of Lazarus and the rich man waking up in Hades in flames, so there you have a kind of a of a mixing of uh, of Hades and Gehenna. So it is a mixed bag. But uh, sorry, I had to give up that uh, that garbage dump thing because that certainly uh, challenged the idea that the Bible has. Uh, a conscious torment in hell uh, in the offing. You know, who's this in from? Uh, from Norm Olson, uh, a veteran Bible geek. He says, do you think study Bibles are useful? Are they helpful, or do they interject too many theological assumptions into the text? Will I be better off with a simple text Bible? Uh, that's a uh, pause here. Uh, that uh, is a very good question. And with some study Bibles, like the Ryrie Study Bible or the Schofield Study Bible, you are certainly getting the text straight jacketed by theology. There's no doubt about that. What about mainstream ones with uh, notes by uh, Howard Clark Key? I had the great privilege of studying with at Boston University School of Theology one semester, and a bunch of others. These people aren't grinding a theological axe overtly, but you do seem to, at least I pick up some axe grinding, like they, they will have a kind of a, a theological structure left over from the days of the so-called biblical theology movement, where they figured they could reconstruct an overarching biblical theology and, uh, and that everything fed into that. Uh, I mean, supposedly this was just exegetical historical description, but it was, it was a, a theological enterprise. It, they tried to develop it inductively from the text. I got a hand of that. But they uh, wound up figuring you had to be able to synthesize 
a biblical theology model that would somehow cover the whole thing, and, and that is almost a straitjacketing. And uh, the salvation history or covenant renewal, uh, I think Key's big thing is covenant renewal as the great theme of the Bible, I, I think that's probably a mistake, and that whole approach is mistaken. There is somewhat less of that in the Oxford annotated Bible. I forget who did the uh, the Old Testament annotations, Bruce Metzger, um, an evangelical, perhaps you might even call him a fundamentalist, a great scholar. Uh, he did the notes there, and uh, he is pretty conservative, but I don't think it affects the, the notes that much. Uh, he tends to zero in on background information that you need, and he's good at that. Uh, so uh, I know the new Oxford Annotated Bible has some advancements based on archaeology and so on, I know one of the guys that was involved with that. I suspect he's uh, inserted some liberation theology where it probably doesn't belong and all that. But I'd say uh, you're going to get a lot of good information from any of these mainstream ones. And as with translations, period, it's handy to uh, compare what they say if you don't mind getting more than one. I think that'd be kind of fascinating to do. It's like comparing different commentaries. And... Uh, all the better. Uh, let's see. Okay, going on with Norm. He says, if you do think study Bibles are useful, then which one of the big three New Oxford Annotated Bible and New Interpreter Study Bible and Harper Collins Study Bible would you recommend? There I am at a loss because I uh, have do not have copies of uh, any of these. Uh, I've looked at them occasionally, but I don't know uh, enough about it. I tend to distrust the translations in that, that uh, are now found in these things, and I'd rather do the, the homework myself. Uh, but I, uh, it's not bad to use them, and I'm sure, of course, my ideal suggestion would be to read and compare all of them. And if you're in the New Testament, you might, if you want a very different slant, you might look at the pre-Nicene New Testament. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, that treats a lot of stuff in the New Testament from a radical, critical perspective. Uh, let's see. Uh, Norm says, by the way, only the Harper Collins Study Bible is produced under the magisterium of the Society of Biblical Literature and has the imprimatur of the SBL for what that's worth. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Norm. That's one of the things that makes me suspicious because there's sort of a prevailing ecumenically orthodox uh, approach that I'm suspicious of. Uh, and the Jesus and Judaism thing. In fact, I'm trying to get a book accepted, uh, Judaizing Jesus, where I try to suggest that that's, there's some ecumenical ventriloquism going on there. Okay, and finally Norm says, would you talk a bit about commentaries, how they're used in biblical study, and again, recommend your favorite one-volume and favorite multi-volume commentaries? I have not used... Uh, multi-volume ones in a long, long time, and I'm not even really sure what's out there. But I've always thought the interpreter's one-volume commentary was handy, and I just ordered another copy, I let mine go many years ago, of the Jerome Biblical Commentary. I ordered the original, not the new one. Again, I, I'm sort of distrustful of these latest things. Now, the Jerome Biblical Commentary, edited by Raymond Brown, uh, all these Catholic scholars contributed to it, but people whose work I have a lot of respect for, Fitz Meyer and a lot of others, and I would, Bruce Vauder, and I, I think that's my favorite, but I that's almost a worthless comment. I, I haven't looked at any of them in such depth. Peake's commentary is a one-volume older commentary that I have and, and still uh, look at occasionally, so I wouldn't leave that one out. Um, no other commentaries. I uh, am not familiar enough with them, but I, I from what I have seen, I like Peake's, P-E-A-K-E, -E, apostrophe S, 
and the Jerome Biblical Commentary, but again, you know, don't take me as any authority on that. Thanks, Norm. Mm, boy, this is... Okay, here's, here's one more from Hans. I have a few more questions for Der Bibelgeek. One, do you know of any readily accessible books which address the connection between Zoroastrianism and Judaism? Oh, boy... Um, I have one called Zoroastrian Eschatology, but that's a very old one. Oh, boy. Um, I don't know how readily accessible this is, but, um, Sigmund Mowinkel's book, M-O-W-I-N-C-K-E-L, He That Cometh, is pretty handy in dealing with uh, connections there between uh, Zoroastrianism and Judaism. Another one, come to think of it, would be, I think, Chaos, Creation, and the World to Come by Norman Cohn, C-O-H-N. That's a very good one. And uh, though it doesn't deal as much as you might like with the connections, it gives a lot of interesting information about both that would be pretty handy. And you can, you know, draw connections and so forth. Uh, Two, in your future book, Moses and Minimalism, is it your contention that the Old Testament Tanakh is on the same level of historicity as the Book of Mormon? That is no historical merit? Or is it that only one idea which you float is that only one idea which you float in this anticipated work now, I pretty much do think it is utterly without historical merit uh, just a few of the late and least interesting things uh, in the second kings seem to reflect some history but on the whole yeah I, I think it is fabricated and mythical history um Uh, Three, do you think it is fair to say that J.R.R. Tolkien's created mythology is influenced by Semitic polytheism? Let me explain. In Semitic polytheism, we have an apparent three-tier system of divinity. On top, El Elyon, God Most High. In the middle, the Elohim, or the B'nai Elohim, the gods or the sons of God or sons of the gods. Uh, the children of El, and on the bottom, the Malachim, or angels. In Tolkien's mythology, we have Eru Iluvatar on top, with the Einar beneath. The Einar are further divided into the Valar on top, and the Maiar beneath, functioning as angels. Is it reasonable to see that Tolkien was influenced by Semitic mythology? Yeah, it's reasonable. I don't know that we could prove it, but he certainly knew about such things. I wouldn't be surprised, and he certainly is using uh, Semitic formations in uh, names like Morgoth, the plural O-T-H ending, and uh, various other ones. And uh, he was a Catholic and was trying to get a Catholic message across in The Lord of the Rings, as he admitted in a a lecture that uh, few have heard, including me, but I've just heard and read about it. That's not at all unlikely. Uh, Let's see. uh, And last but not least, fourth, I've seen a brief survey on the Internet which took information from one of Bart Ehrman's books, I don't recall which one, which basically said that half of all the verses of the New Testament have at least one variant. That's probably misquoting Jesus. How can we talk about inerrancy if there is so much diversity between texts? Well, that gets us into the vexed uh, business of textual criticism, some of the pioneers of which were Plymouth Brethren, fundamentalist inerrantists. And their zeal was motivated by the belief that the Bible is verbally inspired. And they said, they had exactly the question you just posed and said, look, if the words are inspired, we damn well better know which words the text contained. Now, um, I guess uh, after the work of uh, Westcott and Hort, they figured they pretty much had it. Uh, that a lot of new manuscript evidence had come to light, and uh, 
something like the revised version of the Bible uh, embodied a lot of those uh, textual studies. But it's become clear that the textual traditions on uh, transmission were more chaotic than they thought. There appear to be three major textual families reflecting channels of transmission through the ancient world. And it's often hard to know which one has the, uh, the more likely uh, readings, though more and more textual critics are going with an eclectic method saying, well, let's bracket the issue of what tradition this manuscript or that one comes from. Let's just compare the different readings and see which one, like you could short circuit the other question, right? See which one makes more sense as an addition or an omission. And uh, this is to deal with stuff like what I just mentioned when Jesus says, you don't know what sort of spirit you're of. Uh, well, in some manuscripts, after James and John say, you want us to barbecue these guys? It just says Jesus rebuked them, and they went on to another place. But uh, some manuscripts have him say, you don't know what spirit you are of or belong to. And I believe uh, others add, I mean, that by itself may be one version of the text, but some have that and Jesus going on to say, the Son of Man came to save men's lives, not to destroy them. Okay, how are we going to decide what's the original reading? Well, there's a natural tendency to figure that scribes are more likely to add than to omit. If they find a reading that is longer, uh, when they're looking at a couple of different manuscripts to make a new one, they are more likely to say, oh boy, suppose this one is shorter because the scribe who made it just accidentally skipped ahead. I don't know that that's what happened, but I don't want to take the risk of cutting out some of the word of God, so let's put the whole thing in. Uh, yeah, but that just pushes the, the question back a step. And so then you ask, well, is this likely something someone would subtract? Is there, suppose it originally did read, you know not what spirit you were of, the Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Is, is it likely somebody would have cut that? Uh, could it have sounded heretical or offensive to any Christian scribe? Uh maybe somebody would have taken that to imply universal salvation in the wake of the origin controversy. It's possible they might have thought that was too lenient. But uh, on the other hand, it, it se and it seems a bit more likely that the text was just shorter and somebody was curious, gee, what did he say when he rebuked him? Because you do have that in Mark versus Matthew, right, where uh, after the confession of Peter at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus says uh, the Son of Man has to be crucified, etc., etc. said Peter took him aside and, re and, and rebuked him, and then Jesus gives it to him. What did Peter say? Why would he rebuke him? What would the nature of such a rebuke be? Uh, well, uh, Matthew wondered that, so he decided to supply it. In his gospel, Peter says, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Uh, oh boy. Uh, what, uh, so I would say that, now we're not talking about textual criticism exactly here, but it's the same sort of thing with uh, a redactor adding to or subtracting from the text, right? So you can easily see that motivation. Uh, so who knows? It's really impossible to tell in many, many cases. And uh, so, yeah, is it inerrant or not? Now, this may seem like a totally academic point, and often it is, though uh, Bart is, I'm sure, saying, look, I'm not the one making a mountain out of a molehill. If you believe that it's verbally inspired, I'm afraid you have a problem on your hands. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's verbally inspired by God, so we got to be darn sure we've got the thing. No, it, it's a mess, but it, it's not that kind of a problem. But for you, it is. Maybe you ought to rethink your position. I, I think that's uh, what's going on there. But to, uh, to show you the uh, 
let's say, the possible significance of this. In 1 John 5, there's, in the King James, there's this famous statement, uh, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Logos, or the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Well, that's been added. Uh, that's not in any ancient Greek manuscript. It's been added in the Latin Vulgate late in the game. So... Um, that's a bit of a problem because that is the sole biblical basis for the doctrine of the Trinity, and it's not part of the biblical basis. It's not part of the Bible database at all. Or how about that uh, ever popular thing in the longer ending of Mark, popular in my neck of the woods, and I do mean woods, where we have uh, Appalachian snake handling churches. In my name they shall take up serpents, they shall dr if they drink any deadly thing it shall not harm them. Uh-oh. Uh, hand me that rattler, Brother Simeon. Uh, you're only going to do that if you think you got the promise from God that you're going to be okay, but suppose it was added to the text. <laughs> Whoops. So, uh, but most of them aren't like that. Still, he's got a point. If you're going to have a doctrine of pickiness, then you got to be uh, prepared for the, uh, the implications. There is a clever fundamentalist attempt to grapple with this, the so-called preservationist doctrine, because most evangelicals are willing to admit, yeah, we don't know all the time, but at least it's not very important much of the time. But some of them say, eh, that's not good enough. We have to say that, yes, if God had inspired a, a scripture verbally, it doesn't make sense that he would just say, okay, you're on your own, and leave it to the vicissitudes of hand copying for hundreds and hundreds of years. He must have seen to it that the original text survived, though maybe not in one place. And so the preservationist either, uh, I guess you could do both, but either says it the original text is to be found intact in the Byzantine textual tradition that, that uh, Erasmus used to create the so-called textus receptus, the received text, the official text. And uh, all of its readings, including the Trinity verse in John, the woman taken in adultery in, in uh, I'm sorry, Trinity verse in 1 John, woman taken in adultery in the Gospel of John, the angel at Bethesda in the Gospel of John, and the snake handling in Mark, that uh, all of that stuff was original to the text, and sophistical arguments are brought forth to say why uh, other textual critics are wrong, and so on, others will say, okay, okay, uh, it's easy to show that the Byzantine text is corrupt. There are better earlier ones, all right. But somewhere or other, the true reading of every passage is preserved. So it's the textual critic's job to zero in on that and find that. Of course, the trouble with that is, it's as I've just said, it's not possible to determine that without wishful thinking. So I think they're up the old uh, creek on that one. Um, oh boy, what a tangled web we weave and when we practice to believe. Well, that's it for the Bible Geek for today, but I will uh, try to get back with you again tomorrow here in the vaults of Yovambus. And let me thank donors uh, again and uh, people buying my books. Um, it's never all that easy around uh, the price. Chateau, and if you can continue to help, sure would appreciate that. If you can't, look, don't worry about it. There's no admission charge to the Bible Geek. And in either case, I'll see you real soon. <laughs>《The Bible Geek》was recorded by Robert M. Price and produced by John Felix and Sergeon Yovanovich. Theme song by John Morris. Visit us at robertmprice.mindvendor.com for more info on Robert's projects, purchase Bible Geek merchandise, and click the ever-important Donate button. Send your questions to criticus at aol.com, and be sure to rate and review The Bible Geek on iTunes. 
Thanks for listening to The Bible Geek. I'm Torn Anderson. When the bomb's placed on the firing line, so you'd better brush the dust from that old Bible and look up to the stars when they shine.